Solutions to the Dropout Crisis, addressing the dropout crisis one strategy at a time. Brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center Network with support from K-12 and in partnership with Clemson Broadcast Productions. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to Solutions. Here we are in April, one of my favorite months of the year here in South Carolina. The azaleas are out, spring is in the air. It's just a good time, and it's a good time to learn something new, which is why we're here today. Um, I'm here, as always, with my colleague, Karen Withington, who is the Assistant Director of the National Dropout Prevention Center. And welcome, as always, to Solutions. Thanks, Marty. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great. And uh, we've got some exciting things going on in the land of dropout prevention, which we're just going to mention before we get into today's program. So what's going on? I think there's some neat things coming up. Well, I'll tell you about some events we have coming up because we do have some new type of opportunities for our, our normal uh, participants and new participants to come and join us and learn about dropout prevention from various angles. Oh, good. What's first? Well, first up, um, June 26th through 29th, we have a Reaching the Wounded Student mm -hmm. Conference. Um, it's the second or third one we've done on that. It's just a fantastic event. Um, if you're a school counselor, a social worker, you work with students in a juvenile justice system, or you're a teacher, mm -hmm. and you want to be able to recognize uh, students who've witnessed or been uh, the uh, target of some type of trauma. trauma. It could mm -hmm. be chronic trauma, such as poverty or um, living in a community that's you're afraid at all times or whatever, chronic type trauma or a one-time event or, or, or a several-time event, but something that's traumatized students and um, people who work with youth can learn the strategies to be helpful in those situations and help them help those students heal so that they can be successful. And so that's the total focus of that event. Yes, that's it is. That's really good. That's really going to be um, in uh, near Orlando, Florida, Kissimmee, Florida, ah. June 26th through 29th, and that is the 2016 Reaching the Wounded Student Conference. Mm. Looking um, good. What's next? Registration's open for that on oh, our website, so go That's there. important. Yeah. yeah, go there, register now. Go register now. What's next? Um, then we have uh, an, an interesting event, which is the Diploma Planning Institute. Mm. July 21 through 22, we ha are having one in Georgia, Jonesboro, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it's open, though, to anybody across the nation to come. And what that type of event is, is schools and school districts can send teams from their school who want to work on their dropout prevention plan. And it's a two-day event. They're guided through the various parts and things they need to think about in their dropout prevention plan for their school or a school district across grade levels or wherever they want to focus on dropout prevention. And um, two people will be there uh, and a team from the National Dropout Prevention Center will be there. Um, the 2009 Secondary Principal of the Year, Dr. Mark Wilson, oh. Is with us on these, That's great. and of course, uh, Dr. Sandy Addis, our yeah. executive director of the Dropout Prevention Center, um, and it's just a great wow. time for teams to this, work together. Knowing those two, this is not to be missed, and what a great opportunity to make a plan for your school or school district. Uh, I love these focused events that y'all have. This is great. So that's and it. now one that's not totally focused, except for it's all about dropout prevention, <laughs> is the biggie. October uh, 2nd through 5th, 2016, mm -hmm. we're going to Detroit. Mm. And uh, that's our largest event of the year is our network conference. We'll be in Detroit, Michigan, uh, really focusing a lot on how to get students engaged, how to mm. get youth engaged in their own learning. And that's going to be a big focus. And, of course, uh, lots of other topics will also be presented during that conference. So you're still taking um, presentation uh, we, submissions? For pre uh, Call for pre uh, Presenters mm -hmm. is open for that Detroit uh, conference right now. So oh. go to our website, and if you'd like to present, uh, you can find the different strands um, and see if your topic aligns with one of those strands, and we'd love to have presenters yeah. come. So we want not just attendees, but we need presenters exactly. as well. Exactly. And so that's it. this is a good timing for, for that kind of announcement because mm -hmm. you could be part of this uh, whole dropout prevention initiative nationally. So 
It looks like some good things coming up. Yes. Find out for more on www.dropoutprevention.org. Go to our conferences page. Right. We'll have all these up there. All right. So, gosh, there's always so much going on. But there's a special thing today, I think. And the topic today, I think, is, is, is quite interesting and one I wanted to learn a lot more about. And so I'm excited about this opportunity today. And it's on restorative justice. And so uh, we're going to talk about that today in a little bit. And when the program proceeds onward, you will have opportunities to engage uh, in a national conversation on this mm -hmm. topic. Uh, we have on the web page, we have that discussion board. Right. And we have um, other ways of communicating, Karen. What would that be? Right. Well, we can we can carry on a conversation through our uh, the National Dropout Prevention Center's uh, Facebook page. Also, we have Twitter. If you yeah. have a Twitter account, yeah. it's, uh, our Twitter handle is at NDPCN. And for today's topic, we could use a hashtag of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. That's our topic for today. Yeah. So uh, we could have that conversation there. And of course, look at the resources. Yes, that those are, resources. Mm -hmm. I was just going to try to emphasize those resources are really good. And why this is good professional development. And we always like to make the point that this program on solutions, when we focus on one topic, is professional development for uh, schools and school districts across the country. And with the resources, lots of follow-up. Mm -hmm. Lots of follow-up mm -hmm. so you can make change in your school. So that's our goal, is that this will be the starting point for some uh, new initiatives. And so uh, because we have such great support from K-12, Solutions gets to go on the road. And Solutions went on the road recently to the National Forum at Myrtle Beach. And Karen, you got to meet some really neat people from Maine. And uh, Maine's been one of my favorite states over the years with lots of family and school connections in my life. And I love to see great things coming out of that state. And so uh, tell us who you met there, and um, then we can perhaps introduce them to our, to our viewers. Okay. All right, great. Well, yes, we were on the, on the road at the At-Risk Youth National Forum in Myrtle Beach in February. And um, our presenters are all have topics related to dropout prevention. And as you know, Marty, um, behavior issues when children are sent out of class because of behavior or expelled or suspended, these things can snowball and start to cause them to be behind in school, in academics, and this can lead to dropout. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a snowball effect. Right. And uh, I was able in, at Myrtle Beach in February to sit down and talk to um, Pender Macon and Paige Nichols from Maine. They mm -hmm. are both, they co-founded a, a center, the Collaborative for Perpetual Innovation. And uh, the, uh, the website is in our resources list, mm -hmm. and so you can find out more information about this collaborative. Um, but I sat down with them and talked about this topic of restorative justice and how um, we can move away from thinking about managing student behavior to getting the students or being able to facilitate the students to regulate their themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, a little bit of time up front like that can can just change the classroom environment and give the students the uh, power over their own decisions and, and that. So I talked with Pender and Paige, and we, uh, we filmed that for our participants to watch. And I started off to ask them, I learned quite a bit, but I began by just asking them to tell us about the, the collaborative for perpetual innovation, what does that mean, and how? What do they mean by replacing ineffective, punitive approaches with a human-centered approach? And uh, let's see what they had to say. Let's do. We're really excited to share with everybody um, a way that educators and school administrators and adults in any youth-serving organization can utilize the key components of restorative justice in a way that is portable and customizable and uh, can be implemented along a continuum. Because we feel that a lot of schools don't implement these practices because it feels heavy and it seems as though um, people would have to change structures and schedules and accommodate 
cumbersome circles and have pervasive staff development and a lot of staff buy-in, when the real truth is with four critical understandings and using four phases of the restorative process, one individual educator in one classroom could implement a lot of the most important stuff in this work. I should also say before we jump in that everything we're sharing, um, we've done tons of research, we go to a lot of conferences, we try this stuff out, and we've, we've had to learn it out of necessity in working hard with way. the kids mm. that we work with. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, hard, <laughs> it's hard gotten information, frankly, where we learned most of it out of desperation oh. in the field, in the trenches, and so we humbly are excited to share it with well, everybody. Well, it's fascinating. So now you're telling me there, but there are just really four key ideas that we can really focus on right. to get the idea of what you're talking about with the restorative justice. Right, but before we even get to the four key phases, uh -huh. there are four key understandings that adults, yeah, those are probably what you mean, the four key ideas that adults have to actually deeply internalize in order to effectively use the four phases of the process. Okay, so you're gonna tell us some yeah. things we need to get and really exactly. own right now before we can move forward with this, okay. Yes. So, so I'll go ahead and jump right in um, with the first understanding. Um, there's this kind of buzzword in education, um, behavior management, and most people have heard that. Um, the fact is we can't manage anyone else's behavior. Um, as educators and individuals working with youth, we can set up conditions that will foster positive behavior in students. So we're throwing out the idea of managing behavior mm -hmm. um, and taking on an idea of managing conditions and settings. Right. Conditions you and can settings. manage a classroom, but you can't manage another human's behavior, really. Okay, okay. So uh, the second key understanding is that you need to depersonalize student misbehavior, and this is not an intuitive um, step to internalize for most adults, because teaching children is about the most human work you could ever do. You're so connected, and you put your entire humanity into it, and you take a lot of risks and you're working so hard and when children respond um, in ways that are either apathetic or worse, directly um, disrespectful or, or aggressive even, um, it can really feel personal and it can be um, very hard for a teacher to remember this isn't about me and it isn't personal. Um, some ideas for depersonalizing student misbehavior would include using your teacher persona, we call it your emotional scrubs, the way somebody in, um, in a, uh, an emergency room setting would put on actual medical scrubs. It's a barrier. I think uh, when they put those scrubs on, they're becoming superhuman in that moment because they can now do something that I would be on my crying knees um, you know, with a broken child in front of me, literally in an emergency room, whereas in the emergency room of education, you can put on a teacher persona that includes your teacher voice, your teacher body language, um, and certain tricks like uh, scripted phrases that you can use in the times of deepest struggle that provide you that moment of um, emotional distance that's critical mm -hmm. to all of this. And we have um, a whole lot of free, downloadable, and clickable resources and ideas. That's an entire training say, can, in and of itself. That we can go back and read over and over again and start to pr inject into the practice. Absolutely, and, practice. and we'll share how to get okay. those resources after, okay, but that's great. its own um, entire. Great, well that's a good image about the scrubs though, being that sort of this is a way to protect yourself, but also continue to go toward the goal that you want. Absolutely, yeah. and because if you, if you can't have that level of disconnection, um, you will become emotionally elevated and escalated with a student and if you have that level of, an emo of emotional attachment to the situation, you're not able to implement the four phases of the restorative process effectively. So. Um, our third understanding is chronic misbehavior, viewing chronic misbehavior as a symptom. Um, and there's two reasons that that's really important. The first is that it gives you the necessary compassion to not be reactive. And the second is that it gives you insight into how to effectively improve conditions for the student. So um, Ross Green, we have a lot of stuff on our website that links to his stuff. 
Um, but he talks a lot about unsolved problems, unmet needs, and lagging cognitive and social skills as being a reason for chronic misbehavior. Mm -hmm. um, an example of an unsolved problem, or most unsolved problems are invisible to us. And an example of that might be a student is being teased on their bus ride into school and they come into your classroom and you, not knowing that, partner them up with the student who was teasing them on the bus. Um, and then the reaction from that. Um, another type of unsolved problem could be gaps in learning. The student might have missed a lot along the way. So it, that step is particularly important because it gives us as educators insight into what we can do to adapt conditions to better meet the student's needs. So look at behavior as the symptom and then try to go uh, find out the cause, the root cause yeah. of that, what's behind it. allows you it. to, to mm -hmm. really dissect the right. behavior. Right, right. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> and the fourth understanding is, um, oops, keep your eyes on the prize. And uh, that one is about, we're in this for the long game. And when you're an educator, it can be very, and when children are misbehaving in the classroom, and we say children even if we're talking about our 18-year-old bearded mm -hmm. students. I mean, they're children and their brains are still child brains. Mm -hmm. And at any rate, um, we're in this for the whole year with them. And it can be so, the allure of wanting to manage that behavior right now mm -hmm. in the moment, you can send a student out of class, you can call them out by name and know that they might be embarrassed into you know, being quiet. You can single out the three girls in the back of the room who are having a long, in-depth conversation instead of listening and saying, so can you answer that question, Julie? And you know she'll be caught off guard. And you know you have all of this bag of tricks to, mm -hmm. that, that teachers, all of us, have fallen into. I yeah, named these sort of things. an immediate yes. ceasing of whatever exactly. the behavior, or trying to do that. Right, and yeah, and that can be very tempting, I think, for right. educators to immediately address it. And um, if we really remember, what's critical here is that we are forming strong, positive relationships with kids, mm -hmm. and we're trying to create behavioral learning rather than the behavioral management. And rather than so. because I'm here and I saw you or I caught you doing something. Exactly. Uh, get it more where they're right. self-regulating. Right. Um, so it seems like there's going to be, from the teacher's point of view or whoever the is. I want to go to managing the classroom, but anyway, whoever is, needs to get the teaching done or whatever, they're going to have to think about, are they going to spend a little more time? Are they going to go for that really quick? Probably not effective even for the next day. Right. And, you know, how does that, how does it work? Are we going to, I know we're going to get to that, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, to give right. the, the, our viewers some really um, ideas of how they can make it work. Exactly. Okay. And right. actually, you said managing the classroom, uh, and that is what it is. It is okay. managing the classroom, just not the behavior. Yes. Got, okay, good. It's just a subtle difference. All right, all right. I'm already getting it. <laughs> yeah. So those four understandings, uh, may, they may seem simple, and we've bulleted them out as simply as we possibly can. But um, a little background information is also critical in helping people understand. You really, it's not just knowing them or having them as a list in your head. Mm -hmm. You literally need to, and this is probably the hardest work of all, you need to internalize this stuff. And it takes time and it's messy business, so. Um, yeah. It's really the most fundamental part yeah, of making this work. Written on the palm of your hand mm -hmm. or something. Right. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> Remember it, yes. Okay. Yeah, and so, so one of the understandings um, that can really, or one, one piece of information that can help to underscore all of that is um, when you think about the way students' brains work, obviously we want our behavioral um, interventions to work. We want students to learn more appropriate behaviors and to be aware of how their behaviors are impacting other people. We want this to be successful, and yet punitive school discipline is notoriously ineffective. You know, there's usually a cycle of escalation and sending out of the room, sending out of the classroom, sending out of the school setting itself, coming back less connected, et cetera. So um, there's a lesson from evolution <laughs> that can help to understand what's going wrong here. And the, the brain, the human brain has uh, been developing for over seven million years, and um, only in just the very last blink of an eye have we been trying to get students to learn in a classroom setting. Youngsters used to learn in multi-age groups, on their feet, with people who loved them, and from people who loved them, deeply connected groups of people. Um, and they were also learning things that were critical and relevant to their very survival, survival. in the mm -hmm. moment. Um, 
There's a um, wonderful author who we've read a lot of, gone to presentations of his and read a lot of his books, one of which, um, The Social Neuroscience of Education. He talks about tribal brains, which is exactly what Pender was just talking about, um, but says that relational connectedness and patterns are evident throughout all life forms, even at a very microscopic level, um, and that organisms that are separated from their group eventually perish. Um, which just brings it back around to, you know, how important it is to do this as a whole group. Mm -hmm. um, and that punitive discipline can really break up a community when you remove a child from their supports um, and, and from their peers. Yes. Um, and uh, also when you do that, you tend to be exacerbating the very problems that caused the behavioral issues in the first place. So you can see where it comes into a cycle that's um, really unhelpful. And also school suspensions and expulsions have direct links to involvement in the criminal justice system in the future. Um, the school to prison mm -hmm. pipeline is what they're mm -hmm. calling it now. Um, and there's a lot of data like yeah, that exists to show um, that students who are suspended and expelled often feed into the criminal justice system and that there's a lasting negative impact on those kids, which makes sense given the, the evolutionary brain science mm -hmm. that Pender was describing. And uh, one more plug from the cognitive neuroscience world uh, would be with respect to rewards and punishments as um, behavior modification tools. Um, punishment, punitive stuff, and in this case it would be, and when we're talking punishment, separation from the group um, is an intangible but yet uh, visceral punishment of sorts. It's a punitive measure. Um, and whereas a strengthened bond with the group and ongoing connections and relationships would be in this case considered a reward system. Um, rewards and punishments impact children and their brains in completely different a um, areas of the brain and in different ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, punishment, fear-based learning does happen, uh, but it happens in the amygdala, which is the limbic system, that's the feeling emotional part of the brain and not the thinking and learning part of the brain. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, the rewards-based learning takes place up in the prefrontal cortex and in the anterior cingulate cortex, mm -hmm. which can detect um, errors as they're ma being made, can adjust behaviors, and is actually connected to deeper learning and um, can cause long-lasting and permanent change. So pe some people say that they're kind of motivated to do good things out of fear, fear of getting caught or whatever. Right. But that's a, a very, they're not really contextualizing, I guess, uh, they're just afraid they're going to get caught is the only, maybe the only reason they're doing, exactly. making their decisions. Exactly. And uh, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, interestingly, so, you know, if you are looking to do behavior management, mm -hmm. fear-based punitive learning does actually work um, for quick, decontextualized, not that important kinds of behaviors. Uh -huh. So the example. We see a lot um, in the youth, in Long Creek Youth Development Center, where we spend a lot of time with incarcerated kids. They can, the guards there can get 30 kids to line up with their, line, their toes perfectly on a line in two minutes and call off numbers by you know, maybe saying they're not gonna eat their next meal or whatever they're using. Mm -hmm. um, and they can do that really quickly and it works in that space, um, right. but it has no lasting impact and it, mm -hmm. it's completely decontextualized. It doesn't transfer to anywhere else in their lives. Right, right. as far as decision making. There's right, no, no. and in terms of moral development, it is mm -hmm. around not getting caught. It's, mm -hmm. it's not about realizing, wow, I am um, making a better decision because it's the right thing to do. Right. It's, about, mm -hmm. it's about fear. Um, and another, I don't know if we should get into dissociation, yeah, I think we should. Um, another <clears throat> aspect of this is children who have a lot of punitive measures when they're little, they, um, because it's always activating their amygdala and their limbic system when they make mistakes behaviorally, um, they start to associate their behavioral errors with adult hostility rather than with poor decision making. And that translates over so that even, you know, the kids will come to our setting and they will make a behavioral mistake, they'll realize they've made it, and they're immediately on the lookout for the hostile adult. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing you say, 
um, they're typically to miss, you know, they might misinterpret as, you know, the, the children will sometimes say, he flipped out on me, the teacher flipped out on me, and really he said, when you talk them down, like, what exactly did he say? Well, he told me to sit down in my seat. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, that wasn't flipping out, but it, it felt like a flip out and to a negative, the child. And a negative uh, association with authority as well would be Absolutely. there. And uh, so can that be turned around? Yes. I mean, you know, yes. it sounds like it's developed very early in some some uh, children, but yeah. you can turn it around. It takes time. Yeah. And interestingly, the part of the brain that has that reaction, the amygdala, that has that has the emotional reaction, um, evolutionarily it hasn't caught up, so it can't differentiate between like an 18-wheeler barreling towards you on the highway and a hostile interaction with a teacher. Mm that part of our brain actually can't differentiate those two things. Right, yet. it just does some really basic functions, kicks out a lot of stress chemicals that only mm -hmm. exacerbate any issues. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds oh. like we're going toward, we want our young people to have internal control and, and contextualized decision making. Absolutely. And making the right, okay. Yes, that cause and effect. My, mm -hmm. my poor decision making caused me to do, you know, or whatever it is, having children realize mm -hmm. that there is a cause and effect, which brings us to this slide here on internal versus external locus of control. Oh, okay. um, we discovered a lot of research um, on locus of control while we were researching a totally different, not totally different, but a, another phenomenon, um, which is resilience. Uh, at our school, we recognized that these are children who are facing some of the most unbelievably difficult life situations and have gone through stuff that's unspeakable. Um, and so, and yet some of them would be rising up a little bit and some would just never be able to climb out from the ashes. And so, um, we were researching the phenomenon of resilience, which to me seems like holy grail of life. We're all going to face the hardest things mm -hmm. that we can even begin to imagine in our lives. We have that in common, every human does. And yet some of us are going to survive it and move forward, and some people are really going to have a hard time recovering. So we thought, how do we foster resilience in our children at school? And all of the research we found connected resilience with the phenomenon of internal locus of control, which is a person's healthy, accurate understanding of his or her behaviors, words, actions, decisions, and uh, how that impacts their actual reality. Um, so what it looks like, what locus of control, externalized locus of control looks like with our kids, um, they show up at our school, They've been, um, you know, often expelled from their setting for behavior, and we might ask them what wasn't working in their previous setting. Typically, we get answers like, there was too much drama, or all the teachers hated me there. Right. Exactly. All pointing outward at, yeah. at forces that impacted them. Right. They're not usually likely to say, well, I didn't show up all that often, and I didn't try hard when I did. They're more likely to, you uh -huh. know, look out there. So that's when you first meet the, the children, they're, they're thinking yes, of yes, what Yes, right, what they've come to an alternative yeah. setting. Mm -hmm. And for example, um, when I was the principal at the school, um, they would arrive in my office after a behavioral incident and I'd say, why are you here? What did you do? And they'd say, well, so-and-so was running mm -hmm. his mouth and it was always somewhere out there. Mm -hmm. um, and the same kids that do that also externalize credit when they've earned it. So if they've done well on a project or in a sports game or on a paper and you process that with them, they might say that the test was too easy Just or lucky. I got lucky, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so they're not experiencing any personal power at all. Wow. And their belief systems kind of keep them locked in the sense that they don't have any personal power. Interesting. So, with all of that to back up those understandings, okay. Okay. <laughs> there are four phases of the restorative process. So that, this is going to be now how it works. This is how, how it, it works. works. These are the four, the four phases. Four we were phases. calling them steps, but really one blends into another and feeds off of another. So they're phases. Okay. And these are boiled down to the four like most important pieces, and that's mm -hmm. why we decided to call them phases, because you can branch off and have like a 1A and a 2A. <laughs> okay. And, um, but this and is I like do want to tell the, res <laughs> the viewers that we will be putting a lot of resources on yes. the Dropout Prevention uh, webcast page, webpage, right. to go along with this, yep. so we can delve into these 
four A, one A, yeah, yeah, two B. And all of our resources are also available on our website. Okay, and we'll give a link to that okay. for sure. Um, so I'll just jump right in to phase one. Um, phase one um, requires a student to take personal responsibility. So that's in short. Um, of course, oftentimes you get a child who's pretty escalated, um, and you want to assess their readiness to be able to jump into that process. So. If, if, you, if it seems like a kid needs space, we really try to like give them that space and allow them to access their own coping skills to s settle down before beginning the process. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that that takes patience. It takes some time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's why it's critical to have those understandings really internalized mm -hmm. because you're, really, you're in it for the long game. And you're so knowing you're, where you're going. Right. That's right. You're on the prize. That's right. the prize. <laughs> That's right. And so some, uh, some strategies for getting a student to a place where they can take that level of responsibility is listen empathetically to their story because they're going to say, well, so-and-so was running his mouth and the teacher doesn't like me and this happened and that happened. And you have to take them still back to the question, and yet, what was your reaction? What did you do when they did? That must have been terrible. You have to be very empathetic. And validate their feelings yeah. a lot, hear their story, because yeah. that's really important. And then still take them back to, and how did you respond? And when they say, somebody made me mad, we tell them not to give away their personal power. And uh, students, especially adolescents, are very driven by you know, wanting to have control and a sense of control over themselves. And so that's a great key phrase, you know, to say, don't give away your power. Don't say somebody mm -hmm. made you. Nobody makes you do mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. It was frustrating, it was awful, it was disrespectful, and yet you chose the next step. And that's how we kind of pull them back to that. It's one of those phrases that you're going to exactly. be Exactly, and we have a number of those, okay. yeah. And really helping them to be able to separate what everyone else did and what that they did to contribute to the situation. Like yeah. here was everyone else's involvement and here was yours. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's really phase one. And sometimes it takes a long time. You might have to come in from many different angles before a student can reach actually taking personal responsibility. Um, and then phase two is recognizing the impact. We call this in our setting the ripple effect. So really helping kids to see how what they did impacted the others around them. So they might have thrown like, you know, a crumpled up piece of paper across the room at the teacher. And they're like, well, it didn't hurt him. Mm -hmm. He's all right. That didn't impact anyone else. And it often takes a while to see how that impacted like the whole classroom community. Um, and sometimes we'll actually use the visual of drawing like a spiral. I was just and, making that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And students can put their name in the middle and then plug in around there, like names of other people who were impacted or groups of people who were impacted. If it was something that happened on a field trip, how does, what's the broader impact there? Mm -hmm. um, and right, and in a circle situation, when you do have a restorative circle and you're using a formal process, then you have other people to say, well, wait a minute, dude. I was trying to pay attention to something and it was really distracting or somebody else could say it was really disrespectful and you swore and you know it made somebody else feel unsafe and you know so other kids can do the reality check but as we mentioned before you don't always need a circle and this could be a conversation with a teacher okay. and you could bring in a peer if you really find somebody who's reluctant to see that this behavior has actually rippled out. Um, some other kids can come so in. So in the beginning, you might want to do just the one-on-one -on -one until everybody kind of understands what you're, what right. you're doing right. and, and where it's going. Exactly. And then, okay. Um, and then phase three oh, is repairing the damage. It's the restorative step. And mm -hmm. so that's usually fun. Oh. And uh, it is, because okay. by then they've had the hardest part. That was taking responsibility <clears throat> and recognizing that they've harmed other people. Now we get to work fixing it. And that actually does stoke a good part of the brain. That's, you know, okay, so mistakes can be fixed is in and of itself a joyful uh, thing to think about. So if something was physically broken, the child can fix it. Yeah. And you can help them and give them the tools to do it. That's an easy metaphor. That's mm -hmm. often not the case. Mm -hmm. More often, it's the classroom climate was broken, mm -hmm. or somebody's feelings were hurt, mm -hmm. or some other kind of um, a transgression. And you have to get very creative. Um, in some cases, for example, substance abuse um, infractions, especially in middle school and high school for students or for alternative setting students, um, those often lead straight to an, you know, it's one of those non-negotiable, well, you're out of school for three days because you get caught smoking cigarettes or something worse mm -hmm. in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. 
and with a restorative repairing the damage mindset instead you would have the student figure out um, how they're going to schedule some counseling that could be offered or do some research around why uh, that is a harmful behavior and also why it's not allowed in schools and why it's harmful to other people who may be trying to quit. Um, so there were so many ways to approach it. I think in, in like a nugget, um, matching the consequence to the behavior. Often if you ask a, a student why they are in detention, they won't say because I threw a hamburger in the lunchroom, they would say because Pender sent me. <laughs> That's right. Um, which again, like totally externalizes it. Mm -hmm. And right. um, so it's really finding a consequence that matches the behavior mm -hmm. is the purpose of okay. that step. Exactly. Um, and then phase three is sort of... Um, phase four. Phase four. Yeah, last <laughs> one. <laughs> um, phase four is the most introspective phase and it's a, a time that you get to help students engage in a metacognitive process. So questions like, what were you hoping to accomplish when you used the behavior? Okay. Um, what were you thinking? What were you mm -hmm. feeling? Um, and it allows them to really dive in and figure out with a staff member like what their triggers are. Triggers is what I was thinking, and they can remember those for the next time, maybe, oh, this was a trigger last time, and all that, yeah. Right, and then offering them some suggestions for how to respond dif differently, and, or how to recognize a trigger, and what do they feel like when they have that coming on, and how can they intervene before it gets to an escalated level. Right, and if they are able to identify a need that they were trying to get met by that behavior, mm -hmm. you can find a whole lot of more um, adaptive solutions mm -hmm. so that they can get that need met. Mm -hmm. Now, not to be all pie in the sky, most children are not going to say, oh wow, I was really hungry and my parents had a fight this morning and then I was teased on the bus mm -hmm. and nobody pays any attention to me in a good way and I was just trying to get some attention. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say mm -hmm. that, but as you take them through the process of really just stopping and thinking about what mm -hmm. was it that you wanted to happen, doing that over and over creates a synaptic connection in their brain so they are starting to associate their behaviors and their actions with some feelings that they might have had. Mm -hmm. and so you're moving them slightly just toward... thinking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. just along a continuum. So it's, it's a healthy process for them. Oh, so, so here's um, how to make it work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to give you an example. So uh, as, as you can see on this slide, the, the percentages are slightly arbitrary, but what we're trying to illustrate here is that m most of your energy, far and away most of your energy, should go into the prevention, um, mm -hmm. setting up social dynamics, setting up scaffolded academic expectations, um, practicing transitions and entering and, and rituals and routines and so, you know to kind of reduce the likelihood that there would be um, behavioral mm -hmm. issues. Um, and then a little bit more of your attention would go into the low-level intervention, which I'll describe to you now. And then very rarely do you need a full-blown um, restorative process, for the most part, comparatively speaking. Okay. Um, so here's a low-level example. We have some cards. They're called Stop and Think cards. They're pretty commonly used. I think a lot of different programs have them. We print them out on um, brightly colored paper, so they're very visible. And so if you happen to get one from where they hang on the wall behind you um, in an envelope, kids will see it. Mm -hmm. Blaze orange, for example. The stop and think card just really says stop. What, do you, what behavior that is, you know, mm -hmm. that is a problem right now? Um, what can you do to fix it in a moment? Mm -hmm. And that's enough right there. So they can fill that out in their seat. Now here's how it plays out. You're a teacher in the classroom. You've got kids working in groups. There's a behavioral situation. You see it. He sees you see it. You make eye contact as you reach behind you. Okay. Blaze orange. Blaze <laughs> orange. And uh, you, by that time, you've already had a communication with that child without ever saying their name, mm -hmm. without walking over to their desk without any of that other stuff. You have the thing in your hand and you've made the eye contact. That is often enough to write there on a low level and you just put it on your desk. Mm -hmm. Say the, the behavior continues, you can pick it up and walk around the room quietly, but he knows you're coming his way. And eventually you can just slide it onto the table. Now at, at the school where we used to work together, um, once you have presented a student with the stop and think card, it's an invitation to the restorative process 
try to frame it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. They're invited to participate in that process and they can either fill it out now, stop what they're doing, and then re-engage quietly. So that's an option. Mm -hmm. Or they can choose not to, and that means that they've accepted the invitation to a more formal process, which could be um, in whatever structures a school might have. It could be a restorative lunch time or an after-school session that's a deeper conversation. And so it puts some power back with the child. Okay, interesting. So yeah. that would be, that's an that's example a, of a low level. Low level. And right. It, and it's just pretty quick, too. Yeah, I mean that was a pretty and it really it encapsulates you know kind of the mm -hmm. mindsets and how you don't have to follow phase 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 mm -hmm. phase. You take these as a general um, mm -hmm. guideline. Mm -hmm. you it's have up to, to the work. individual to regulate. Right. Uh -huh. right. And then on a broader scale, this is the part where um, I think many districts and, and schools and practitioners say, "Wow, restorative practices would be a really good thing to implement." All the research says it's great. I really wish we could do this, but. It's too cumbersome, it takes too much, it's you know, a whole systems thing, and teachers are really um, ha are suffering from mandate fatigue at this point, and folks are, are wary of adding something more to their plate. Um, however, when you do decide to embrace a whole district approach, it does require quite a bit of adult training, because you can't have a couple of us treating behaviors one way and then having other adults treating the behaviors in a different way when you're trying to do a, a systemic mm -hmm. thing. Um, and there's a lot of practice and a lot of mutual support and collegiality and trust among the adults in the school setting are critical. Um, and then school-wide, you've got to directly teach and rehearse the behavioral expectations so that every adult in the setting kind of knows and every child knows, here's what it looks like on the playground, here's what safe behavior is in the lunchroom, and we all have the same language around behaviors. Also, grade levels in schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also being sure to build a culture of trust and problem solving with students. So in some settings that might be having a team meeting every morning and talking about making mistakes and that it's okay to fail and here's how we problem solve it as a group and um, having that culture already existing in the school. Mm -hmm. um, and then also considering a peer leadership group, like a core group of um, maybe natural leaders who have struggled with behavior themselves in the past who can help facilitate that. It's a lot more meaningful when a student says to their peer, you know, dude, you were really, like, really disruptive in class and it was hard for me to get my work done versus when Pender or I say, <laughs> yeah. you were disruptive in class. So um, um, we have a peer leadership group that has been really, really effective in our setting. Yeah. And one of our peer leaders is actually um, going to appear in a one-minute video clip in a second. Here. She's, oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I look forward to that. So, how do you? How did you? I mean, you just offered that as an option. People could join. How did you get that um, group together? Yeah. So we, we sort of handpicked. Like mm -hmm. an email went out to teachers to identify like natural leaders in their classroom, okay. and they were invited. A lot of kids were invited to an informational session, and then since then, it's been you know training on the restorative process with peer leaders. We've got. We've been able to take them to some conferences. Um, we meet once a week as a group um, to talk about like how they use their coping mechanisms and how they can model those for other students. And, and some of the kids who have struggled the hardest yeah. with their behaviors and with the process itself are some of the more effective peer leaders because they can be, I know exactly how this yeah. feels and yet this is the thing. We've seen some really heroic work on their part. Oh great. So. Well, I can't wait to hear from Yeah, her. she's great. So we thought we'd touch on restorative circles because when people think of restorative justice discipline in schools, circles are mm -hmm. um, a pretty hot item. Yeah. But we have a lot of cautions. And so we'd say all of the, the approach, the mindsets, the phases are all, anyone can begin to work with those. A circle, you're taking some risks. And so here's how I would decide personally. I would say if an entire group was significantly impacted by the behavior, and, these are three ands, not one or the other, mm -hmm. just three, all three. And um, if the behavior was not a bullying behavior, targeting an individual or a group of individuals, so that's not a good time for a circle. Bullying oh, okay. behavior is absolutely not. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually dangerous and mm -hmm. could re-victimize. Right. And then also the third and is if you have a group culture that has had some successful circle experience, and uh, by which we would say, and we have some little tips that I'm putting up on this slide, um, that you've used a circle, you've come up with norms, you've used the circle to decide minor 
issues in the classroom and that sort of thing. So, and that people can do that fairly respectfully. And we have some resources on our website for the scripts that for they offer for how to follow this, um, how to facilitate a circle if you choose to do this, ways to prepare for it. Yeah. And so, um, as we mentioned, just to, to summarize, an individualized version of this can take place in the moment, it can be for lower level behaviors in the flow of the classroom, or it could take place in another setting, preferably after class or after school or during a restorative learning session. Or in detention or right. a Saturday detention, right. something like that. May involve peers, but not necessary. So we're trying to say you can take these approaches in your pocket and customize. And we really want you now to hear, this is our Great. This is our finale. On Wednesday, we were creating this presentation. We do a lot of these trainings, but we always try to customize for the purpose. And we called up Jamie, and Jamie graduated last June, and she's now a college student. And I called her up, and she was in her dorm room, and I said, what are you doing? <laughs> she said, <laughs> she, she agreed uh, to create this little video on her own computer, oh, and she webcam. emailed it. Oh. Restorative justice is not like traditional public school discipline. Restorative justice holds the student accountable for their actions and makes them take responsibility on fixing the bridge they broke. For instance, if a student gets upset and punches a hole in the wall, they personally have to spackle it up. They also talk with an adult about why it escalated to that point and how that affected others. I personally have had traditional discipline in the school setting as well as restorative justice. I understood more about my actions through restorative justice. It helped me realize that there are consequences for my actions, and it also helped me fix any relationships I damaged as a result of my actions. And being the rebellious teenager I was, suspension was just a free vacation. With restorative justice, it taught me that I will always be accountable for my actions and to always try and think before I do anything. And so she's one of the most challenging behaviorally students we had. I think she'd be okay with me saying that. Mm -hmm. And um, she overcame so much and received a great big award at the end of the school year. So. That is fantastic. And she's really um, owned it for herself. And I, I, you can tell she has seen the benefit of yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, she just did that on her own in her dorm. So, so in conclusion, because we have to wrap up. Um, <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> yeah, we want to send you off with like, here's what to put in your pocket, okay, like the great. big takeaways. So um, the four understandings, which are you can't manage other people's behavior. Behavior management is a myth. Um, don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. Scrubs. <laughs> Emotional scrubs, exactly. Um, identifying the purpose of the behavior. The and keep, mm -hmm. keep your eye on the prize. Gotcha. And yep. be patient. And then the four phases are personal responsibility, recognizing the further impact, fixing the problem, the restoration step, and having a plan to get your needs met in a better way in the future. Thank you both so much. This has been so informative and the practical examples and everything. You know, we just really appreciate you being here to tell us about this process. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. It. Thank you. Well, Karen, that was terrific. I really learned a lot about restorative justice, um, something I've always wanted to do. So thank you, National Dropout Prevention Center, right. for bringing this to all of our attention. Right, and thanks to Paige and Pinder for their work. Alex, absolutely. I was really impressed. Um, I like frameworks of things and kind of organizing my thoughts about things. And I like those four understandings. And I'm going to go back and look at that part again. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everybody else to kind of have that framework in your mind as you look at it. It changes your whole thinking about things. So I really like that. And what about that young woman who, oh, right. in her video, that was a terrific that story. That was moving. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it just shows you a case. It's good to put a face on these things we talk mm -hmm. about. And so it's great that you made that video to share and that we've actually been able to see it. So wonderful program. We want to remind everybody about the resources they'll find online to continue this. And um, anything else you need to say well, about this? We'll be on the road more, thanks to K-12 uh, and their sponsorship. We'll be on the road more. This one was at our uh, At Risk Youth National Forum in Myrtle Beach, which we have every year, mm -hmm. and so there'll be another coming up in 2017 there, um, but we're just really excited to get the opportunity to have uh, 
programs that are brought to you from the, the settings where the people are doing the work. And That's exactly right. It's just a wonderful new addition. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are at the end of, of the program, and I look forward to some exciting things next month as well. So um, we hope everybody's enjoyed the program as much as I have, and we'll look forward to seeing you the next time, uh, which is in May, the second Tuesday in May at 3.30, right here. Uh, thanks very much for joining us.